Okay. Um, for those who are watching the video, I'm Stephen Downs, and this is a meeting of the uh, PLE group at the National Research Council here in Moncton. It's July 7. And I've got uh, Chucky Ragui and Todd Bingham and uh, Hanan Sitla with me here. And the object of this exercise is to go through the Grasshopper web application that I've developed. I developed this, and, and so what I'm doing here is I'm presenting it for the members of the PLE team, and that's where my attention will be focused, not to the recording. Um, I'll try to keep my mind on that. So basically, the uh, Grasshopper web application was developed in order for me to produce my newsletter, and it's sort of grown in purpose and scope over time. And so, in the end, I've tried to make it adapt to the uh, the main idea of the personal learning environment. And this is Scott Wilson's famous diagram, of course, with the personal learning environment right in the middle there, and then the different things that it connects to externally. It doesn't do all of that yet uh, by any stretch, but that's where it is heading at this point. So here's a uh, diagram that I drew to describe where I'm trying to go with Grasshopper and uh, you can see the, uh, the input content display and then the content editor and then the output where you would send your completed content. This diagram actually reflects something called RSS Writer that I've, I created sort of as an add-on to Grasshopper and I'll just pop into here and, and bring that up. Uh, I need to remember what it is. So this is RSS Writer. And it's a very early prototype PLE. The content comes in on this left-hand side here. So if I select an entry, I have no idea how well any of this is going to work. So here content comes up. And then the idea is that you take your content. This is uh, content from my own uh, uh, web blog. Take the content, you can drag it into your editing window, and you do your editing and working with it. And then eventually you can send it to, you know, whatever your, your blog. Now the, uh, the submit doesn't work because Google changed its API on me but you would just submit it. So the idea is content comes in from many sources on the left hand side. Here are the different sources you can choose. You work with it in the editing window and then you feed it forward. So that's kind of where I want Grasshopper to go somewhere in the future. Uh, that's, that's the model that I've been working on thus far. The code, it's, the Grasshopper itself though looks very different from that at, at this current point in time. So right now, the way I've got Grasshopper set up is, uh, oh, oh, this is a Grasshopper presentation. So we'll go through it now. G-R-S-S hopper downs .ca. So, and actually, better yet, I'll, I'll go to um, my own personal version of it, the one I use for my website. This is an instance of the same software and I'll pop out of it. So now when I try to go to it, it requires my uh, login. So I log in. This is just your, your standard login, although it does support OpenID uh, as, a, uh, uh, as a client only and not an OpenID server. I used to have it as supported as an OpenID server, but I don't at the moment. It would take some messing around. Uh, I would like it to be an OpenID provider at some point. I think that would be handy. Uh, I think people should be their own OpenID providers and not need to rely on things like Facebook or Google or Twitter or whatever. But, yeah, so I'll sign into it. And so now, whoops. To get my password wrong, which figures. There we go. And so this is the, the site administrator post login screen. A user will see a similar screen, uh, just with fewer options. 
uh, and in particular they don't have the site administration option that I have. So that, that was my login. Now when people who are not me log into the site, they are also given the option of signing up for subscriptions to newsletters. And again, like I say, this uh, supports my newsletter system. So if you were some sort of stranger just creating a new account, oops, you, you would create a new account using the, uh, the, the newsletter subscription, select a username, select a password, and enter the email address. And then you can pick which of these newsletters you want. And also, where did you hear about the website? I find that actually kind of useful. We're just starting up the uh, new version of the uh, Connectivism course. I just opened up the signups yesterday for it. And we've got a bunch of people in already. And it's nice because most of them are telling me where they found out about the website. I want to fix this a little bit. I'm not as happy with selecting a username as I used to be. I'm thinking more either it should all be open ID or username should be email address because people forget their usernames. I always do. Um, and also to usernames, you have the whole problem of username duplication and things like that. So that, but that's simply a change in the screen. I don't need any change in the back end to make that work. I just need to change the input screen and just say enter your email address and they'll enter their email address and that'll be stored as their username. So anyhow, so that's the uh, the newsletters. I don't remember where I am here. So as I said, the uh, Grasshopper was used for the uh, connectivism and, and connective knowledge course and we organized the the content in that course and and I organized the content on my site in, in pages I'll show you what I mean here so we'll go back here and we'll go back to my admin menu am I logged in yes so here's my admin menu so I have various pages I'll list the pages these are all pages on the website and uh, as you can see, I can edit, delete, or publish the page. Uh, take any old page, say the, the home page. As you can see, I've got a, a variable, not initialized properly problem here. Um, but uh, we'll go in here. This is the uh, home page for my website. Could be any page on the site. The title of the page, page file. The idea here is to create pages that are static and load simply as HTML pages. So the bulk of the access on my website isn't to a CGI script. It's simply the plain HTML pages that have been created by the system. That really reduces the overhead. And I've learned I have to do that. So, and then this is basically the way the pages are set up is there's page code, then a page description if you want it for an index or anything like that, and then the page content. And the code defines the way the page can be created, making calls to the database. And so you, you define the page by defining the code. And then when you publish the page, this generates the actual content for the page, which is then stored here. So you would not edit in this content section directly. I just have that there for reference. You would edit in the code section. And description is meta description is just a, a free text description of the page. But is it inserted in the code for search engines, for example? Or? No. 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 But I could. Uh, I certainly could do that, but I don't. Um, it's a good idea, actually. So, the way that, and the reason why I do it this way is I, I can actually display a page three ways. First of all, as I said before, it's a static HTML file. Secondly, by simply retrieving the cached version of the generated content from the database. And then third, by generating it directly. Because when I, when I generate a page, I'm doing database calls and I'm you know, getting stuff from other tables like lists of posts and whatever, which takes up quite a bit of server overhead. 
if I retrieve the cached version, it's you know one database call basically. So it's very quick. It's a lot quicker than retrieving it with all the different calls. You know, I have to retrieve a dozen records or whatever to compile the page. So I can access a cached version of the page, not as fast as an HTML version, but a lot faster than the generated version. So it gives me sort of a midway way of doing it. I have found that to be actually quite useful. So here's the generated version of the page. And it's just my home page, as you can see. And here's if I wanted to publish the page anew. So here's the published version of the page. And as you can see, it's the flat HTML. But if we go back to the, uh, the generated version of the page, it's page 50. And then force equals yes means don't just take it from the cache. Regenerate any generated text in the page. So far, so good. All right, so there's, there's more to that, but we'll come back to that as we go through the presentation. So anyhow, so here's uh, content from the, uh, the CCK08 page, which is also created with the same system. So that's connect.downs. I guess it's CCK09 now. So this is generated using Grasshopper as well. It's not simply generated using the uh, the same software. This is the same instance of Grasshopper. I have one code, uh, one instance of Grasshopper can be used to generate multiple sites, multiple templates, etc. They use different databases, and Grasshopper uses a configuration file. Whenever a page request comes in, checks the configuration file, and then loads the appropriate page. And that, that includes the presentation layer and the configuration file? Uh, the, the configuration file is, is it's kind of hard to just say presentation layer and content layer because there, there are numerous layers. Configuration file, I'll, I'll show you one here. I should have actually set this up ahead of time, but I didn't. And now I have to go find it, and it's underneath here. So, where is my FTP? Where's my FTP? I still can't see it. it. Must be under here. Yeah, there it is. So, the configuration file. Everything wants to update. Everything wants to update. So here we are. So here's a, here's a configuration file. This is for connect.ca. And uh, actually, maybe I'll take one that doesn't have crucial data in it. Uh, uh, let's take demo. Yeah, demos again. So there's a few clips from that video where it showed the password. <laughs> uh, but it's just these are all just basic properties for the website, including all the, the whole permission setup. And so for uh, for each site, a different uh, config file is loaded. And then what happens is when Grasshopper, uh, well, I use the, I use, um, well, I use two things. I use the HTTPD to recognize the uh, domain being requested, and that's just to serve static files. And then the um, Grasshopper code itself looks at the source of the script. The source of the script will have the domain name, and then it extracts that domain name, and then depending on the domain name, selects a configuration file. So it knows which domain I'm looking for and picks the appropriate file. Clear enough? So, so as I say, there are, there are multiple sites, including this one, etc., for uh, each installation of, of Grasshopper. The idea is, so you can have an instance of Grasshopper, install it on an ISP or a university or whatever, and then support multiple individual uh, accounts because the important thing about a personal learning environment is that it's personal. It belongs to the person. 
So whether it's on the server or on the desktop or wherever, it still needs to be personal. It's not something that you log into that belongs to someone else, like Facebook or Second Life or a learning management system. It is owned by, configured by, run by the individual. Very important in my mind. So it, it uh, auto archives. So if I if I come back into it here, I'll, I'll come back in here. I can choose whether or not to auto publish, and I can choose whether or not to auto archive. And if I choose auto archive, which I have for some of my pages, then any time I publish the page, it will create an archived version of the page. So here's my newsletter, for example. I'll go in here, and oh, it's a bit surprising. I probably went into oh yeah into here. Here we go. So here we have auto publish, auto archive. And so if I pop into the archive, this is automatically generated. There's a script. It creates this these tables based on the file names that are archived. And so here's the there's here's the file name. 09 is the year and then the date and then the reverse directory of the uh, page. So the pages auto archive and just get tossed in as HTML pages where Google can find them and index them. And then the archiving system simply uses this page name to generate this table. I've tried all kinds of ways of archiving and this is the only way of getting a lot of content onto a single page because as you can see there's a lot of OL dailies to archive. You know, and over time this proves to be true of any site. So so that's the auto archive bit. Now, as you said as I said, I can create custom pages, any number of pages that I want. And the pages can be generated out of the database. And this is this is a key feature of Grasshopper. And and something that I don't think people are really thinking about when they're talking about personal learning environments because you know, you, you look at Scott Wilson's stuff, etc., and it's bringing stuff in, and it's giving you an editing window, and it's sending stuff out, just like the RSS writer that I showed at the start. But that's it. There's no real local data creation, data management. There's no, I'm not sure what the word is, no cognitive semantic capability created for the user. And I've tried to build that into this. So. When we, if we look at the side, this side here, these are all the different types of content that can be defined or that are defined for my personal website. This is pretty flexible. It's not nearly as flexible as I would like, but I can create other kinds of custom content. Each of these kinds of content corresponds to a table in the database, which means each of these kinds of content can have their own fields, their own definition. So, this new part of the, uh, the setting up of the, the site, so you can have it that list with the, uh, the categories or the attributes in the configuration file, which would just do a that's, of create. Yeah, that's what I'm working toward now. Right now, there, I have a kind of configuration file, but it's set up in, it's hard-coded still, but it's basically, it's a structure. Uh, and all I need to do to make that work is instead of predefining the structure in the code, import the structure from the uh, configuration file. It's, it's like half a day coding that I just haven't had time for, but that's totally what I want to do. Um, there's a few things that need to be thought about which I'm sure you would have thought about uh, in doing something like this. Field definitions have to be set up so that we can define what type of field to define when we're creating tables or whatever. Because, uh, yeah. And uh, so I've actually spent time in the code. Uh, so I have a list of field types now. And then I have my, uh, my tables 
I might like my structure of tables tables match to the field types and then when I display I just uh, call up the view for the appropriate field type which is a fairly standard way of doing it but the idea here is to put this into the user's control you know and like the closest I've seen in in other products that I've looked at to this is the um, CCK in Drupal the content creation kit in Drupal it's good it's got a lot of weaknesses though and the major weakness of CCK is it actually spreads out the content of a single table over several tables uh, because there's the default table that Drupal uses and then CCK operates by adding on additional tables to the default so you end up doing like three four uh, calls to a database when really you only need to do one maximum so there's an issue there and as a result CCK and Drupal uh, was for me very slow I tried it and it was it was simply for the volume that I was dealing with it was simply it wouldn't work you have to do yeah, and you can't you can't you can't do page caching with CCK and Drupal. It's just not there. You can't. No, well, it wasn't there when I tried it. <laughs> Anyhow, so, but now I have this and I have all kinds of caching and it works just fine on my site. So, here's, and now, and the other thing too CCK did, didn't do, was any sort of relational uh, aspects. Uh, so, you, you couldn't say this is uh, like a, a key from this is a secondary key in another table or anything like that. It just that just wasn't there. Maybe it's there now, but it wasn't there before. There were standalone tables of different content types. And that's it. And again, I want people to be able to have, say, events that are associated with people or, or feeds that are associated with websites or whatever. Um, you know, I want people to be able to create, if you will, their own entity relationship diagrams, but without having to think about entity relationship diagrams. But they should be able to model their world in some way, it seems to me. I think that's important. So the way pages work now here is that a page will get information from the database. So you can do ordinary, right, here's ordinary text, that's fine. But now here we have what's known as a keyword command, and it's kind of hard to see, especially if you're viewing this on the screen, so I'll just make this bigger. That should be big enough. And what the keyword does is it defines contents that are going to come in from the database. So keyword database is post so I want it to come in from the post 20 items 20 records type is a standard field in the table so post type equals announcement format is an optional feed or sorry an optional uh, field in tables and so this format is announcement email expires this is the number of hours and so anything older than 24 hours will not be included all means to search all records uh, in the database otherwise it'll just quit it'll look at 20 the first 20 if it doesn't find anything it'll quit so I have to tell it to look through the whole database and then sort options and that's my keyword command so it's basically a straightforward way of creating a search request except it doesn't use SQL it just uses variables and so basically I can use any field and value as a variable plus I have a set of reserved variables such as number DB format and sort uh, which will have specific meanings so I've got four keywords in here. This one will pull all of the announcement posts. This one will pull all of the presentation posts, or all the presentations, sorry, DB is equals presentation. This one will pull all of the article posts, and then this one will 
pull all of the linked posts. So this automatically creates my newsletter page for me. And when you look at my newsletter, sometimes it has an announcement at the top, usually it doesn't. Sometimes it has a presentation at the top, as it did last week, for example, usually it doesn't. And this is all just done automatically. If, if there is a presentation, it'll list it. If there's no presentation, it won't. And then finally, the links that I, I submit, these are posts of type link, and it'll pull the first, uh, well, yeah, the top 20 of those from the most recent 16 hours and that's what you see in my newsletter every day so to see what this looks like here's the generated version of the page I'll make it smaller again so these are links these are posts that were created posts of type link that were created in the last 16 hours so you might ask where do those come from we come back to the admin menu and instead of looking at pages we'll look at posts so here are the posts 24,000 posts on the system here are the ones that we just saw in the newsletter and here's what it looks like that's what we saw in the newsletter and now here is the form to create the post and this is what I use to submit individual entries into the newsletter. So I simply I type title, link, author, etc. Whatever field var values I have defined. And the way I define the tables is I define not simply the fields that it has, but also the fields to display. So I can have fields that are, are not displayed and, and there are various fields here that are not displayed. For example, the creator uh, is not displayed, the owner is not displayed, uh, the post key is not displayed. I don't want people messing around with that. Now, I also have a setup for harvesting feeds in Grasshopper. And so I have a feed management system and we'll pop into the feed management system here still need to make this a little smaller feed is just another data type i can list my feeds list feeds please and we wait I don't know why we're waiting oh here we go so here are the various feeds now feeds are have their own attributes over and above just regular attributes uh, if we take a look at this feed it's the title the link which is the feed itself the HTML associated and various other content these values are actually filled in the harvesting process so to create a new feed really all you need to do is submit the URL and then in the first harvest all of these other values will be filled by the harvester for you. I do have a cron job um, that I sometimes run. Right now I'm not running it because I have like 700 feeds and there's a, that's a bit of a load on a production web server. Um, one of the things I have discovered is you can, you can harvest 100 feeds no real problem. Uh, you get above that and you begin to get lag in your web server when you're serving pages when something over here is harvesting that many feeds and it's not the harvest that's the problem it's the processing and I just need to improve the processing and the real problem that I've run into is processing the categories the auto categories which I'll talk about in a bit so that, that's an issue to, to look at uh, until then, I'm going to need to put the harvester and the uh, the rest of the system on separate sites. But you know that's not going to work for an individual, you know, for a person. Also, I'd like people to be able to share harvesters in some way, rather than have to harvest the same feed four, five, eight hundred times, harvest it once and then distribute the contents. But I don't know how to go about that just yet. But it's certainly worth thinking about, particularly if you have uh, a single instance of Grasshopper running on a website like this where you have multiple sites, 
if they could possibly share. Although here, all the feeds would be different, so it wouldn't help at all. But anyhow, so, so when a feed is submitted, I had a system where people could submit the feed URL to me. And, uh, and I still have that running, actually, in the CCK08 course. Um, I wonder where I put that. Feeds. Uh, these are the feeds. Yeah, here we go. Um, so this was open to the public well, to the public, to registered members of the course. So students who are in the course could submit their own feed. And then when the feed is submitted, when it comes in, it comes in as pending. I don't think I have any pendings on this one. I might have some on Connects. Oh, yeah, there's... I'm not logged in on that one, and now it's going to take a while. There's basically, there's three statuses a feed, uh, a feed can have. The first status is pending, and I have a little orange button for that. Approved, so I have a little green button for that. So here it is. Uh, and then the red button is retired. I don't delete feeds, but I retire them. The reason why I don't delete feeds is what happens a lot of the time is a feed will run for a certain amount of time, and then it'll stop. The person quit, whatever. But I still have a whole bunch of records from that feed. So I retire the feed, which stops harvesting, but the content from the feed that was previously harvested remains in the system. And also, the retired feeds don't show up on the feed list, or don't have to show up. You can display feeds that only the approved feeds. So that's a, a status of A. So, basically the, the idea here now is that if we go back to the admin, I have a harvester I can harvest either all feeds or the next feed in the queue. The, uh, I needed, again, I had 700 feeds, right? And this stopped, well, it stopped working around 100 feeds, harvesting them all at once. So what I did is I set up a queue so that, and then I can run a, a cron job to simply harvest the next one in the queue. And then I ran the cron job once a minute. So once a minute, it would harvest a new feed. And that way, the harvesting of the feeds was spread out. That worked really well, except for the processing time. So I'll harvest next in queue. So now I'm harvesting now. So this is harvested the next in the queue. And as you can see, when it harvests, it doesn't just harvest. It does some analysis. Uh, here's one of, the, uh, one of the records in that feed. But also, it's looked to see what other sites were linked by that feed. And what I'm trying to do here is analyze the contents and find out who that person is linking to. Also, and I'm not sure if it'll show up here. No, it's not gonna show up here. Uh, also, it's analyzing the contents in order to assign it different categories or topics. So I'm doing a semantic analysis on it, plus I'm doing a network or link analysis on it. I'd like to do more analysis, but this is actually too much as it is. So the idea is I'm harvesting, I'm bringing stuff in, analyzing it, and, and generating additional data. Whoever they are, they're early. Okay. I could harvest all feeds, but I won't. Because that would tie up the system for the next 10 minutes or so. And again, for any individual feed, I can harvest it. And why is that not working? Well, like I said, it's not perfect software. Oh, I know why that's not working. Um, when my system auto updated from mod Perl 1.99 to 2, a number of things stopped working. And that was one of, uh, I thought I caught most of that, but harvest is actually 
if you look at it, it's actually a, a, a separate function. So, or can be run as a separate function. So, so I've got on the one hand all the different kinds of data and the pages, and on the other hand, I've got the feed and the feed parsing. So. I've actually got a fairly good foundation here to do a bunch of interesting things that you can't do with, with just uh, an ordinary blogging system or even something like Drupal. Here's the, here's the harvester again that I've just showed you. Now one of the things that I want to do is map incoming stuff. Now this is something that doesn't work perfectly on my system unfortunately. But the idea of mappings is that We create a mapping. Ah, for crying out loud. Gotta fix mappings, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so this is not gonna work at all. Oh, that's really annoying. This, no. Uh, okay. I can still show you the nice picture that I have. So the idea of mappings is that the source. When when the sort when when I'm harvesting, the the mapping looks at what's being harvested and then selects according to source, and then maps table elements from that source into table elements in the database here. I really wish I hadn't turned that off because it, it's a lot easier to explain with the page where you can look at it. Exactly. That's exactly what it does, and and basically the the mapping, the edit mapping screen was a way of defining. You you, you have on the left hand side the list of tables in the incoming XML, and on the right hand side you have the list of tables on your own system, and then for each table coming in, each each data element you map it to a specific data element. And you don't just have to map data elements. You can map according to the value of the data elements, or you can change your mapping depending on, well, the, the type of incoming feed or whatever. So, for example, I could input RSS feeds. The, the mapping system will look at the RSS feed. If there exists an event tag, in that RSS feed, or if there exists, actually more accurately, if there exists a start time tag in the RSS feed, then it'll map it from RSS to event on this system. So it'll take an RSS event announcement and put it into an event database, or sorry, an event table on the... Uh, no, but it doesn't, doesn't matter. Although, there, therein lies one of the difficulties that I've run into um, using, in Perl anyways, there are different ways to process XML. You can use uh, various XML processing libraries. Um, I forget what they're called off the top of my head. Um, Live XML or something like that. And it'll, it'll uh, process the XML and toss it into a structure and then you analyze that and get your data. Or there are some uh, RSS and Atom specific modules. I use the RSS and Atom specific modules in Grasshopper now because they're a lot easier to work with. The Perl X XML harvesting and parsing is, is messy. Um, can be done, but it's messy. The problem is the uh, the RSS and Atom modules in Perl are not extensible. There's no easy way of adding, well, no easy way, there's no way of adding non-standard non RSS or Atom feeds into their definition. So right now, I'm kind of stuck. So really what I have to do is go back to LibXML or something like that in Perl and just write a module that does all of that for me. And, and basically takes 
that content and makes it, puts it into a form that can be used by Grasshopper. Not too hard a thing to do, but it's just, it's a royal pain to do. Uh, I've done it in the past and then the thing changes and I've done it, you know, so like Perl modules are, are also a pain to work with. And the other problem with Perl modules too is they're not maintained properly, so they don't work as well as they should, you know. Uh, they depend on C libraries like SAX, for example. Uh, I could do a native Perl XML parser. I have written a Perl native XML parser, but it's slow. So you can see my sort of dilemma. So XML parsing is the bane of my existence. Uh, seriously is. Um, which is why I so like JSON, because there's no XML parsing in JSON. So, yeah, it's a miserable, miserable thing. So anyhow, but that's what the mapping system does uh, when it works, which it has sort of worked, but it's never really worked, and then it takes, you know, it takes processor overhead. But one of the things, for example, I wanted it to do, and I will make it do, is you can see this mapping here. It's looking for an, a feed from a certain specific uh, RSS feed, which is my blog, and instead of saving it to uh, just a, a normal uh, input RSS item, it will save it as a post, and in particular, we can't see it here, but it will save it as a post of type article. So, what is that a post or a message of the blog? It, it basically it creates an instance of my blog inside here. So and it, and it, and not simply an instance of the blog, but a, an instance of the blog that is tagged post article. So it's a very specific uh, piece of data inside inside my system here. And so then I could just you know I have a page keyword db equals post type equals article, and it'll produce my blog, you know, any time I uh, post something on half an hour, it'll automatically show up on my page here. That's what I want. And it'll do only mine. If I wanted somebody else's, I can do somebody else's. Or if I wanted, I can say, instead of looking for the type, I can say, filter it for a topic. Because the harvester analyzes for topics. If it detects a topic, then it will take that particular item and filter it and put it there instead of in the regular spot. So I, I can very precisely slot incoming items into whatever content type I want, where these types I can manage as I want. So, and just as an aside, but this is where you'll come in, Chow Key, and where Zhao will come in a lot. I'm trying to get this the data coming in to be as meta tagged as possible, as analyzed as possible, so that we can apply some kind of intelligence to that. Because we want the PLE to do stuff for us. We don't want it just to be some kind of thing that sits there like a database. We can just invent a database or a CMS, right? We, we want it to, to look at the content, analyze the content, uh, you know, identify clusters, new potential topics, all of that stuff in the background. Semantic map. Semantic, exactly. So, yeah, something that's more than just a text manipulation thing. Anybody can build a text manipulation thing. It's not hard, right? Uh, but it's not going to offer any particular advantage to the person who uses it. We want, I would think, people to use the PLE because it does stuff for them. It, it helps them navigate through a lot of content. It helps them organize it and understand it. Would it be an approach that would be something like lip minor? Or lip sure. Minor? Absolutely. Any, any data out there, anything. And, that, and that's, that's the other part of the reason for the mapper, right? I don't want to be limited to blog feeds or I want to I want to be able to access any kind of data out there, access whatever there is, filter it for only that information that's relevant to me and then organize it 
analyze it, organize it, and then take that. Yeah, and then do intelligent so, things so with it. From, from mapping, you have a relation one to one, one to many, or many to many? Um, each mapping is basically a one to one. But you can basically do a many to many or a one to many or a many to one by using multiple mappings. So in this case, if I have um, half an hour and a map you know, mapping to cost, I can do the same thing with half an hour to articles. Yes. In this case, I will have two mapping and the content with the redundancy. In post and articles. Yeah, you could do that. There's nothing that would stop you from doing that. But, uh, That's your same, choice. <laughs> yeah, in the same web, w website, I don't like to have redundancy. Yeah. So one of the things that could be added to something like this would be a little intelligence behind it that would look, you know, like when you create a new mapping, it would detect that you're creating redundant uh, data and then give you a warning or an alternative or something like that. I think that would be a useful feature. But, you know, I don't think we want to make it impossible, but I do think we want to, again, it's, you know, the, having the tool help you as much as possible. I think that uh, um, if we uh, make some analysis before, mapping will be one-to-one -one very easy. We, we will not you see if mm -hmm. we do some analysis before analysis of the data yeah we can after that uh, on the fourth end having mini ma mappings yeah. mini to mini the, the the question is though is who is responsible for this whose decision is it and i think the the user should be able to decide how they want to set up their mappings, right? Even if it allows for the creation of unwise mappings, we can warn them, but I don't think we should set up the system in a way to make it impossible. That's just my thinking. Now this is, and, and I'll, I'll bracket this too by saying, this is just the way I've done it so far. Um, but, you know, one of the reasons why we've got a bunch of people here is to try to come up with better ways of doing this sort of thing. So if there are better ways of doing the same sort of thing than mappings, that'll work for me too. So I don't, I don't want to say this is the way it's going to be done. Cause that would be... I would have done it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we come back here now. So that's... I really wish I'd been able to show that. Well... So here's just another view of the harvester, um, and again, the idea is to, to try to make things a bit easier. So this is, I call it the viewer, because I really have no imagination when it comes to these names. And all that this viewer does is view the uh, data that's come in, so I don't know why it's taking so long. Actually, the reason why it's probably taking so long is I've got a gigabyte of video data here. So this is the viewer. This is stuff that I've just harvested. So beautiful interfacing. Uh, yeah, yeah, and this is me experimenting with Jason. This is all Jason power. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, this is stuff that was harvested. So this is somebody else's stuff. Um, and it's uh, I'm accessing it from the from Grasshopper using JSON, and then I've got a nifty little button there, so it preloads my post form for me, and now I could update the uh, record here. I'm not I'm not going to do this one because there's way too, I have horrible time with international characters, so I see dead people. Uh, what on earth? Okay, hide it. Oh, here we go. This is actually useful. Open educational resources presentations at CETUS 08. So I'll blog this. Uh, so you see the similarity here between what I've done with uh, and I don't know who the author is. 
I could say I'm a trip to do and lie. <laughs> and now I update this. Updating, updating. See how it's very quick now to create an item. I'm spending most of my time waiting for my computer because it's got a two gigabyte Camtasia file. Now if I go to OL Daily, OL Daily, so let's look at OL Daily and now the generated version of OL Daily has the item right there and that's all I needed to do to create an entry in my newsletter. Oh, really? It hasn't published yet? No. No. So, but this item, the, the way I've set it up now, and it wouldn't have to work this way, but this item now is available through the RSS feed. Because the when I generate the page, it generates the RSS as well for the page. Yep. So, well, Todd answers his phone in the middle of this recorded presentation. <laughs> I'll move on. So this is the post editor that I've already talked about and you guys have already seen. Uh, and as you know, Grasshopper code is open source. Now, is there anything else I want to cover with that? Um, yeah. One thing I've been messing around with as well are serialized feeds. This is another site being run off the same instance of Grasshopper. And the idea of serialized feeds is um, you create a bunch of posts ahead of time and then so here, here's, here's a course. A course consists of a bunch of posts these each are individual posts in the course, and I can go in and edit them. Yes. Yeah. And so, and here's the course feed. Now, what happens is when you generate a post, if if we can, I wonder what that's. Oh, that's still doing this. Okay, I wondered what that was. Uh, if we, if we come back and let's let's look at a post and this is true for any post not just the ones there there's a field called offset and for the um, serialized feeds if you give a post an offset value this is the number of days after the start of the course to put this post in the RSS feed Right. So what the what the system does is when a person signs up for a course oops, there's that same thing again. Gosh, darn it. Yeah. When a person signs up for a course well, they're all gonna be like that now. Well, you just saw that. I can go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm recording it, so of course it's going to do stuff like that. But uh, again, like this is a, a perpetual project under construction. When a person signs up for a course, what the system does is it creates a whole set of RSS pages, and so, day one is the first day of the course, whatever day that happens to be. Uh, an, an RSS feed for a given day. One feed for each day? Well, there can be. There, or one feed, specifically, there's one feed for each day there is content from the course matching that day. How would you subscribe to it though? If there's just one. Well, it, I'm accused of writing something. Yeah, and of course, this is breaking on me. Oh, that's so annoying. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Okay. So, 
and I know what the cause of that is too. It's it's kind of neat to know the cause. It's a, it's all a mod pearl artifact. All right. So, kind kind of a nasty concept to explain. So, you sign up for a course, and the way you sign up for a course is you go to the course feed. Okay. Now, that has, and then all you do is subscribe to this feed. Okay. By going to the feed, you have signed up for the course. There are no logins or anything like that. So I can subscribe now. This is day one, cohort number 167. Now, where does that 167 come from? Each new day is a new cohort. Or you can set it up so a new cohort starts once a week or once a month or whenever. This course gets a new cohort every day. So it's actually 167 days since I first created this course. So it, it could be day one for Mr. X and day 27 for That's right. Mr. Z, but they'd be on separate cohort. They're in separate cohort numbers. Okay. No, so given the offset, they will have the same content with the offset for the cohort. Basically, you see, if we look at the address of my feed here, so it makes everything bigger with that. You can see it clearly on the page Can you? Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, if you look at the address here, that's right. So here's the course number is 127. That's the fallacies course. 167 is the offset. Assuming this, there, this was being used regularly, there would be a 166, a 165, a 164, an XML feed for every possible day of the course. Separate feed. Okay, so right now course number 127 has 167 separate RSS. Probably less because it doesn't get signed up to every day. But it could have that many. So, we sign up. Today, this is the content of this. Um, day one. How do we know this is the content of this? Because this is the content with offset zero. Actually, it's the content with offset one, but we'll ignore that. Right? This is the content for the first day of the course. Right? So, the system, I have a cron job, and the cron job runs every day. Tomorrow, Uh, feed number one, or sorry, tomorrow for course number one, for cohort number 167, it'll be day two. So the cron job will look for all of the posts for course number 127, and any post of offset two, it'll put into the RSS feed. If it doesn't find any, it won't do anything. The feed is the same, doesn't you? Right. Yeah. It, it will put... Yeah. See, so now once... Now, meanwhile, yesterday's feed, the one that was joined by people yesterday, let's see if anyone did. Nope, nobody did. So let, let's go... Well, I don't, I don't know what ones exist without looking into the directory, but if someone had joined yesterday, if we looked at 166.xml, the content would be the post with offset 2. If we looked in 157.xml, oh, somebody did join on 157. It's day 10. Some people do take this course. It's so kind of neat. Well, no, you, you only subscribe once, and the feed will give you new content every day or every week, depending on how you set it up. You can, uh, something in the and yeah, well, I just use a cron job, right? And there's a script. The feed for today for cohort That's correct. Ten days ago. Right, so there are but ten the days. Total, the maximum, uh, the, the expand, uh, extension is 167 from the beginning. So 157 has started ten days ago. Right. And actually, the course itself only runs for about 100 days. So, I'm not updating 
number one at all anymore. Oh, you have 67 classes left. Right. And another 100 or less on the go. And so, if I could have shown you that screen, you can set that all up on the screen and then create your own course. And I set it up so that people could create their own courses. And you can see a few people tried, but then I ran into, ran into this Mod Pearl upgrade issue. And so that came to a screeching halt. That's on my list of things to fix. I've seen courses online for assessment. They all start at the same time. Everybody has to be. Right. Or even a few yeah. screeching halts. Yeah. Right. 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 But this way you have, you know, for popular subjects, you'd have separate cohorts for each day. I want to support communication between the cohorts. I want to support harvesting. So you take somebody who's in a certain cohort and they declare their own blog URL and then the system harvests it and puts it into their cohort thing. So, and I'm, I'm planning to use the serialized feed system for the uh, connectivism course coming up, Are if I can make it work. Of, uh, work the yeah, I yeah, I, I want to make that work. But I have a question now. Uh, mm -hmm. This uh, process thing makes it impossible for someone to see forward. You have to wait yeah. your chronologically. You have to wait, yeah. So you can get an advance or when you have time? No, but, but, I mean, depending, I mean, it depends on the person because all of these, you know, it depends on the person creating the course, all of these posts exist already. They're all done ahead of time. So they could, if they want, make them accessible simply by defining a course HTML page, which lists well, which lists like the course outline with except with links. Yeah, well you just you just list all the you know, list them in order of the offset. So you could make it possible if you wanted to look ahead. Uh, or you can make and you know, anybody who can figure out the numbering system, it's pretty straightforward, can figure out well, it might not be that straightforward now that I think about it. Yeah, you can figure out what it yeah, you you could probably do what we did and, and go back to the previous version. Yeah. So I am it's it's nothing secure. But but it's not intended to be. Yeah. But it's not intended to be anyways. It's intended to be being it's like this because it's easier for people. Now here's this well thank you. Uh the thing is too now the PLE is a wonderful teaching tool as well as student tool, right? This is intended to fit within the PLE. This is using the PLE as a teaching tool. But the idea is if you're a student, you're a student from your system, you subscribe to one of these serialized courses. So the idea is that part of this project is like it's not just the student tool, it's creating stuff for institutions, for teachers, for publishers, or whatever, to feed to personal learning environments. So we, we want to kind of handle both sides of it because, you know, it's, you know, if you have just the PLEs and nothing providing content for them or activities or whatever, it's, it's got, yeah, exactly. So, so there's that. And the other thing, which is kind of neat, and I know I can make this work in some useful way. Oh, crying out loud. <laughs> well, because there's a course, right? And But then there's separate groups of people within that course. And typically when we're talking about a group of people moving together at the same pace that are in a common course, they use the word cohort. Right. Yeah. Sorry, the C chat's doing the same thing, and I can probably make it work very simply with a very quick. <laughs> Yeah.
Here's kind of neat. I'm recording me doing. Where did it go? There it is. Me doing. This, this is, when people see that I'm doing this, they'll go, oh, oh my god. She says, it's such an ugly hat. Okay. See if C chat works. If it doesn't work, I'm just going to give up. Nope. Oh well. It was too much to hope that I could do it in five seconds. Anyhow, what C chat is, is a system where you can have one chat, and well, it's, a, it's an online chat. But there's also a screen that allows you to display it in front of a room in really big text. And I use it in my talks. And so it's a way to add a nice chat system to things. So I'm sure there's a way to incorporate that into... Now, is there anything else that I have forgotten? Um, not really. Uh, let's see, mailing list... Okay, the newsletters are simply pages. So you create a page, you have at the same time created a newsletter. And then in the uh, configuration, you can de define which of your pages are newsletters. And those are the pages that will be made available when somebody signs up. And then to send the newsletter, you just simply, well, you can test the newsletter which is what I always do, uh, he says, not truthfully. And then you can send the newsletter just by clicking on that. And I'm not going to, because it actually will send the newsletter a bit early, and I don't want to. Uh, oh, yeah, the, uh, the feeds, the list of feeds can be exported in OPML. The uh, feed list can also import a list of feeds using OPML. Oh yeah, I can still go back in. I can change that at any time. Yeah. Oh, actually, I'm going to leave it in. It's a perfectly good article. I like the overlap tasks. Another thing I have, and this is, again, a thing that's really been awkward, is topics. Uh, this is the auto categorization system. Um, nobody does it like this, and I don't know why. Because. This is all your feeds coming in. No, these. Okay. This is. This is a list of feeds on different categories provided by the system. So, let me first define what a category is. Auto categorize. It's. Regular expression based. So, uh, if we go in, uh, chat rooms might be a good one. No, a lot of them are just keyword because it's easier. But um, here we go. Yeah. yeah. So exactly. So there's the regular expression, and and you can see it there. Uh, oops. It's fairly long. So that regular expression corresponds to the tag titled academic journals. And so the regular expression, as you know, is going to take in a wide variety of, of uh, combinations of text. Online journal, academic journal, electric journal of, or electronic journal of, etc. Something to think about, eh? Oh yeah, it's totally going to be beyond. 
the average person's capability to code a regular expression and define that as as a uh, topic. But if we can come up, you should have an interface where you enter, for example, yeah. the root of certain keywords or stuff like that. Yeah. And the, regular yeah. the the main point is it it defines categories as regular expressions. And by defining categories as regular expressions, I can have much more expressive categories than simple keyword-based categories, uh, very expressive categories. And I also have a very simple mechanism for determining membership in a category. I simply apply the regular expression against the title and description, or whatever fields I want, but I apply it to title and description. So anytime I create content, or any time I input content or harvest content, I apply my regular expressions, my categories, to that content, and that automatically categorizes it. It does it brilliantly. Yeah. I sometimes call it an, an automatic tagging system. So if we if we look at say this post. These tags were created by that system. So now I've turned it off because it's a little slow. And it's slow because of bad coding, not because of bad concepts. And I know if I just go back in there and I've got loops within loops and I need to fix that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so it's, it's like it's just bad coding somewhere and I don't know where. So. But the idea, now the idea of, so now each topic, yeah, each topic also corresponds to a page. And when that was running, it would actually have all the posts, all the harvested links, and then on the left hand side, it, it brought in the Wikipedia article on that uh, topic and put it in there. Yes, uh, they subs could subscribe to them either as RSS or as a JSON feed. Uh, again, the, the main reason why I've turned it off is, of course, the search engines hit this, and when they hit it, they hit it hard, and it was generating like the Australia topic page on the fly. Uh, it wasn't properly cached. So when the search engine hit it, it's going to hit it three times. JSON, XML, and then HTML. It's going to generate it each time, and it's going to generate it by looking at the tag and, and checking. Well, I have a tag index, but it would generate the tag index. But now, search engine is going to run through this page. Well, it's actually, I have about three or 400 uh, different topics. And it'll run through that in 10 or 15 seconds. And so what I'm what I'm doing now is I've got a search engine that's just generated something like I don't know 500 or whatever or 5,000 search uh, complex search requests in the database. And it was it was just the system was sagging. So it was the search engines that forced me to disable that for now. Um, but it does produce really beautiful topic pages. Um, I've also got in this does work pages for or maybe it doesn't I think not should pages for individual authors maybe unattributed it's a bad example yes well this is a comment that has come in which is pretty useless I guess I shouldn't be saying that on tape Various are various authors is my favorite author. Uh, yeah. Here we go. So here's the author, and it'll list all the authors, all the articles by this author that I've written posts on. I could add all the items harvested as well, and then all the items. Of course, that's not working properly because it has an ampersand in it. So, you know, all kinds of things that sort of almost work but don't quite work. George Siemens, 
And these are the articles I've written posts about that were authored by George Siemens. And then his newsletter, these are posts that appeared in eLearn Space. So, again, the idea is to show this all different views of the same content and, and to try to do that seamlessly and in the background. Because it auto detects the author and, and, and the journal when it's creating these. And so, if we, if we look at the link for that. But that was something too that you know, with all the here. Yeah. Editing and, and you know, adding extra tags and social Oh, sure. Yeah. To open it up, but also to restrict it to within a person's social network so that it's opened up, but not to spammers. <laughs> Yeah, so there's a lot of concepts from the social networking side that can be brought into this that haven't been brought into this yet because really I don't have very many instances of it. So, so that's basically Grasshopper in a nutshell. Uh, there's a, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, because there's all kinds of stuff going on, but. Uh, um, yeah, um, yeah, exactly, because I get, uh, well, there's a whole comment system, right? So people can comment on the posts, and the way I've set it up is I have a, a multi-layered spam filter, so it's all internal. It doesn't draw on an ex external system um, like Aximet or whatever, uh, and the, the spam filter applies it differently whether you're submitting anonymously or whether you're registered and of course it doesn't apply at all if you're admin uh, it'll filter out control characters um, single apostrophes to uh, avoid uh, database injection um, it filters out um, a lot of tags more tags well all tags if you're anonymous and some tags if you're registered uh, it does a semantic analysis. If Do you use the topic categorization to do this too? In the spam filter? No, no but you could. Uh, you could very easily, right? You, you could restrict content. You know, if it doesn't match a topic, it doesn't go in. Uh, but that might be a bit too extreme because people's comments, sometimes they're not very wordy. And you, you want they're not wordy comments comments still to be allowed if they make sense. So you might add a list of topics or keywords or you want to explain yeah. so yeah. do that semantic analysis. Oh sure, yeah, absolutely. I mean it could be it, it, that would be a one liner. Or literally a one liner. Uh, but anyhow what happens is like, I do a lot of the management of this system from my email. And so is my email running? No. Uh, I won't start it. But um, so when somebody submits a comment, basically this pops up into my screen as well, into my email screen, and so I can edit it, delete it, or flag it as spam. If I flag it as spam, it will remove the post, and it will also um, take the IP and ban that IP and give people one chance to uh, submit spam. <coughs> So now, of course, this so, is. But if it's for company, some of our company, so we ban all the users from the same IP. That's right. So, so far, it hasn't been a problem. Others. Yeah. Well, yeah. Basically, if, if if yeah, I know because they rotate IPs, right? I mean, mm. but uh, mostly though, it's. Um, the, the spam comes from uh, these botnets uh, of, of uh, hacked computers. So basically, uh, I'm blocking it from some person's hacked computer. But if that hacked computer is on an ISP, then yeah, I'm, I'm going to be blocking it. But just just for that one specific IP. <laughs> um, and my defense of that hasn't been a problem. Uh, there's just there's so many IPs out there that the probability of a real user having that same IP is so small that it just simply hasn't come up. 
in years of running this. I've done this. I've used this system for years. So. And you vet every comment from your email or email? Every, everyone comes. Yeah, but it's really easy, right? Because it comes in. I look at it, and That's if I. Number of them daily. It's it's not that it's not as huge as you might think. <laughs> um, my comment system is a little unstandard, and people don't find it perfectly friendly. Also, to I have a system set up so that you can sign up and receive responses to your comments by email, but it's not turned on at the moment. I had a little glitch with it, so I turned it off, and I never got around to fixing it again. But really, that should be part of it. Um, but yeah, it's really important to be able to control the spam that comes into your system. Similarly, <coughs> excuse me, registrations. Anytime somebody registers on my system, I get an email, and I have a link in the email that allows me to immediately delete that registration, because fully 50% of the registrations on the site are spam, which of course figures. I don't use CAPTCHAs or things like that because I don't like them. Um, I find it just as easy to do this at the back end. So now I'm definitely going to stop because uh, the LCT group should be meeting now in this space. It's canceled. Oh, it's canceled. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. I forgot. Yeah, Rod's not here. So. Yeah, and and for the uh, <laughs> so. So, and for the comfort of people watching it, so I, I mean, I am going to stop the recording.